Okay, so we're going to talk about, uh, so I brought in the ruler uh, because the laser pointer no longer works, so we've upgraded uh, from a whiteboard <laughs> with a broken projector to now a small TV with a laser pointer that doesn't work. So we're getting some things together and not others. In any case, <laughs> we're going to work on ankylosaurs today, ankylosauria, I should say. This is the other branch of the shield bearers. So this will be stegosaurs form one branch. And you'll see that stegosaurs generally uh, remain mobile in the sense that their bodies don't get strongly ossified uh, other than the large plates and the tail spines. But they're, they're fairly flexible animals. Ankylosaurs do it another way. Instead of remaining limber, they uh, increase armor to the point at which they are more restricted in movement, and they become very, very slow animals as a result of that. So we're going to talk about, uh, like I said, the ankylosaurs. You can see this orange box down here at the bottom. Really, we're dealing with a very small snippet of the uh, Dinosauria family tree, again, this is, remember, we're going to go through, we have just this little tiny bottom of the tree to go through for the next few weeks because this is our, our ornithischian dinosaurs. But this, uh, this branch is actually relatively interesting, and that's why we're going to spend time on it. Again, this is the, the Thyreophorians, the armor bearers, the shield backs. Uh, these groups do persist until the end, so ankylosaurs are definitely around at the Cretaceous extinction event, and they also do not make it through. This is the same as we had last time. Distinguishing features for the group itself, not for ankylosaurs, but is that broad process of the jugal and then the parallel uh, rows of keeled scutes uh, along the body, which again is very obvious in these groups. So we don't, it's not very hard to distinguish them. This is the basal member, remember, and what we see that with the parallel scutes. On the basal lineages, they're all over the body, and chylosaurs will retain that component, that the scutes will remain along the entire form of the body. They're also going to add more scutes to other locations, so you're going to see them add more and more scutes to places like the tail. And they're even going to do things like have bone protrude from the skull and add long processes uh, out of the head, which will actually be skull bones that will be coming out at some point. So these guys are going to continue to that, that increased armor. Of course, one of the things about increasing armor and therefore weight, right, because these are bones and they're very, very dense, is that that's going to increase weight considerably, uh, and that will make them uh, almost immediately quadrupedal. So they're not going to be, th with stegosaurus, we debated maybe they're quad, maybe they become bipedal if they need to, or maybe they can at least rear up. Ankylosaurs are almost certainly not going to be rearing up anywhere soon or any time soon, and they will be relatively uh, focused just at the ground level. So all of their, their actions will come at about the ground level. I mentioned this again, Stegosaurs, uh, the anti-predator strategy there is probably more of an offensive strategy where you stay relatively mobile and you attack out with the tail to protect yourself. This, the large plates on the back may be under sexual selection, not clear, but they may also be useful in just deterring predators by being large. So size is certainly something that animals can use. Armor is another very common adaptation uh, to dealing with predators. That's the assumption that uh, I will be captured at some point, and I want to make it very hard for my predator to access the soft, meaty parts that I provide. So we, you can increase armor. Things like armadillos do that, right? Problem for an armadillo is it can't be super fast, although these guys are actually surprisingly fast if you ever try to catch one. But do not catch one. They carry leprosy. Uh, they're, they're the animal model for leprosy, so do not, do not catch armadillos. Just look at them. <laughs> Uh, and if you do catch one, make sure to wash immediately. And so I, I know this partially because I knew someone who caught armadillos. Anyway, <laughs> armadillos have a lot of armor on their body, as the name implies. They aren't that fast. They're relatively slow. Uh, but that doesn't matter very much if you have lots of armor. It's, it's relatively hard to access the soft, uh, delicate portions of the body, which are protected when they roll up in those little balls, not dissimilar to something like a sow bug or a pill bug, depending on what you call them. That will also limit things like speed, of course, as we get armor. And there's the other option, which these groups are not really going to participate in, probably is a cryptic. Um, and you can see this frog up here participating in that, uh, an anti-predator strategy where instead of worrying about uh, when I'm caught, you assume that you will never be caught. The idea of being really good at being cryptic is you never seen, right? That's the hope for at least a cryptic animal. Uh, and then, of course, size down here with the elephant. 
elephants by default when they reach adult size are effectively uh, immune to predators. Very few predators can access an adult uh, elephant uh, and they will live out their natural lives until they probably until they get uh, sick. If we look a little bit beyond the armor, so this is an ankylosaur head here, we're also going to look at uh, what's inside of the head. So if you do CT scans, so if you actually go through and scan the skull, you can look at uh, these structures within it, right? The passageways that were present within the animal's skull will remain if it's, if it's well fossilized. And here, what you can see, this blue uh, passageway that's looping up here and then folding back down into the yellow, that's actually all the nasal passageway. And your book uh, makes, I don't know if, it, it doesn't make an argument per se, but it, it, it states that that is probably because these guys have relatively well-developed senses of uh, smell. There is actually a fair amount of debate about this. Uh, nasal passages that are this convoluted might also be important or might be primarily important for the removal of heat. So imagine if you're a huge ankylosaur with lots and lots of armor. And the other problem for dinosaurs is what thing, what way do, an, do mammals get rid of heat? What are the two primary ways that mammals get rid of heat? Panting and sweating. Panting and sweating. And what do dinosaurs not have? They don't have sweat glands. So they're definitely not sweating. Uh, they may do panting, but a lot of dinosaurs, and especially things like ankylosaurs, and we'll see when we look at these uh, uh, bodies, the heads are relatively small compared to the body, and that will absolutely be the truth when we come to sauropods, which will, will not be able to get rid of heat uh, by sweating and will not be able to get rid of heat by panting. So they have to come up with a different strategy. One option may be that, uh, not dissimilar to the way that mammals can also do this, camels are actually very adept at this, uh, is that they expel a lot of heat through uh, the nasal passages. So they allow evaporation to occur all along uh, the respiratory canal, and then they expel very, very hot air out into the environment. And that's even more efficient if you have a one-way flow of air, as dinosaurs do, right? Because you have cold air coming in, and then it, it all the cold, the, all the hot air now is being pushed, flushed back out. So you get cold too hot, as opposed to the mammal version, which is cold air in, mixes, uh, now it's sort of warmish hot and then expelled, so you don't get as clean a, a control of that. So I want you to understand that, yes, these nasal passages may be for, for smelling things. They may work very well in that way, but they may also be primarily for heat exchange. And then the other thing uh, that authors have also postulated is that for sound generation, and, uh, and chylosaurs may also have been able to hear very low sounds very effectively, and those are the kind of sounds that would be made in those chambers, those resonant chambers. So. The idea that it's for one thing, uh, they may in fact all be right, right? It may be incidental that you can make sounds within the nasal passageway and then that gets used within the lineage. But the idea that it is just for scent, I want you to be a little bit careful of. We don't know that 100%. Uh, the one of the, what's one way that we could detect if scent was really uh, probably the, the way that that was working? Yeah, so if the area of the brain was developed, were you going to say the same thing? No, I was going to say diet. You could look at diet. That's also a fair point, that you could argue that uh, if diets are relatively restricted or something, that might work well. That is much harder to do, uh, but I think a relatively reasonable hypothesis within that. Uh, but the, the easiest way is probably to look at the brain. Ankylosaurs, I think this is on the next slide, ankylosaur brains are not much to speak of, so um, they, they don't have a particularly enlarged scent of, uh, location for uh, olfactory control. Ankylosaurs are relatively uh, moderate in size, for, again, for dinosaurs, and I am going to make the caveat here that the bias in dinosaur research to date has been towards medium and large bodied animals. And that's because those are the animals you find first, right? If you went out into the environment today and you stood in a location and you looked around, the first things you would see are the largest animals and then you would see some medium sized animals. And after you had done that, then you would find smaller animals, right, in general. That's how, we, that's how it operates. That's not dissimilar from the way we find fossils. First fossils we're going to find are the big ones, right? The big, the really cool ones. We're going to find those. But at some point, people are going to be excavating smaller and smaller and smaller uh, fossils. And that is, in fact, true. And there's a, there's a study in, um, from Dinosaur Provincial Park showing that they have basically found all of their medium and large giant dinosaurs now. And they may have a few more to add, just a couple of species over the next 50 or 100 years. But they are, they are finding small dinosaurs at the rate at which they initially found large dinosaurs right now. So we're going to add a lot of smaller dinosaurs. 
So I think this moderately sized thing uh, or large size thing is definitely a bias we have right now. Probably ankylosaurs do have to get to a certain size to uh, receive the benefits of all that armor, but um, I, 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 I'm not entirely convinced that these size ranges are, are terribly uh, accurate for the group. In any case, uh, they might be up to nine meters long, so this is length, but in actuality, when they're standing up, they may only re their head may only be about at my knee or maybe up to my hip. So these are relatively low animals, right? So they may be long, um, but they're not particularly tall. So you could ride them, basically, basically is what I'm saying. <laughs> the, again, uh, in a very similar way to the other ornithischians, we have hind limbs are much, much uh, longer than the forelimbs. So this is really going to prevent that, that problem with the, the hind limbs actually stepping on the forelimbs when they try to move quickly. As a result, guess what? They're not going to be able to move very quickly. And that should not come as any surprise to you. Uh, when you have so much armor, there should be no need to move that quickly. Their feet are going to be hoof-like feet. Again, it's not going to be particularly surprising. Hoof-like feet are really, really good if you have lots of weight to, to put on top of very strong pillars and you don't need to move. Uh, or you can move very quickly or not at all. But if, you, if you're not terribly worried uh, in either direction, hoof-like feet work really well to put weight straight down. These are going to be globally distributed, uh, but there aren't any from Africa yet. So they must have appeared before the, the Pangaea split. So why, if, why would they be globally? If we haven't found any in Africa, why would I argue that they're going to definitely be in Africa? Right. That means that they're probably at least kind of freshly to enter the at some point on the African continent. So right. That they're kind of just in Africa. So if we have ankylosaurs in North America and Europe, right? So if we have those groups, then they and we also have them in South America or any other of the other uh, southern of Gondwana. Uh, then we know that they must also have been present in other locations because they must have been when all of those were connected at some point. So absolutely. So we don't have any from Africa yet, and that is solely because we haven't really had a chance to look there. Africa is a fairly un unstudied as far as dinosaurs are concerned. I, this is, should not be surprising. The primary people, places people have looked for dinosaurs extensively, North America. Uh, to some degree, there aren't as many but uh, sediments of the right type to look for, but uh, in Europe. And then in some places in Asia, we actually have a, a fairly good um, bookkeeping record. Uh, not everywhere, but at least in some places uh, we do. But places like uh, Antarctica, of course, we don't, and places like Africa, we don't. These, for Ankylosauria, these are most diverse in the Cretaceous. So, Stegosaurus seem to be present uh, primarily in the Jurassic. We saw that, remember I told you that the Stegosaurus really are targeted around the middle to late Jurassic is where we see them. They probably make it through the Cretaceous. We don't have any members at the very end of the Cretaceous yet, but we do have some from the middle Cretaceous, but they're going to be rare. Ankylosaurus actually seem to do relatively well. They're not super abundant or super common, but they're certainly there and they're relatively speciose by the end of the Cretaceous. We don't really have them in the Jurassic, so they, they must have arrived, uh, they may have arrived relatively late on the scene in that way. Okay, so most of the time when we go to look for, oh, I will tell you that this right now, this white circle is circling an ankylosaurus, uh, an ankylosauria uh, member. The, you can't see it very well, but I'll explain the story behind that. Most of the time when you go to look for ankylosaurs, you should look inland, right? These animals are going to be slow plotting animals and they're going to have to be, because of that, they're probably going to have to be in areas that will remain vegetated year round because they won't be able to migrate particularly long distances. This animal is actually, so these guys are miners and they are uh, working through marine sediments and they happen to, so unfortunately this is actually just the half of the animal. They, when they were digging through, they cut through the other half and, and pulled that off the block. So this is the, the back half of the animal that remained after they did that. They contacted the Royal Tyrell Museum, because this is in Canada, uh, and had them come out and grab them. Because they're marine sediments, th they do occasionally find large marine mammals, or uh, 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 reptiles, so they do occasionally call them out to come collect them. When they came out, they were surprised to find that it was actually a armored dinosaur uh, out in the marine environment. So that does not mean that armored dinosaurs swam out regularly into the ocean. What they think happened was that uh, an animal died near a coastal zone. Its body uh, got washed out to sea, at which point uh, it was bloated from bacteria. 
At some point, the uh, bacteria gas expanded inside the body until it blew up. And then uh, because, because of also the way it landed with the armor actually sitting on the bottom, the animal flipped over and sank straight down and it, it sank so fast that nobody had access to it, landed on the bottom, was covered by sediment, and then uh, sat there until we ran into it again. So they do apparently uh, uh, make it out into the marine waters, but that is not by chance. This is probably what happened, right? That there's this, I wanted to show you this exploding whale in the first lecture and I couldn't, unfortunately. But there are exploding whale videos out there and you should definitely look at them on YouTube. It, whales, after they land on beaches and die, will are filled with bacteria like everybody else, and the bacteria will break them down. Whale skin is, is relatively tough. It holds the uh, bacteria inside. This is true of humans as well, but uh, or any animal. They, they, they will break down and, and have bacteria without, inside them. Anyway, but whales are just so massive that when you when they, their skin does finally break or you pop it, they just it just blows up, and it just spreads whale goo everywhere. This is probably exactly what happened to the Sankylosaur that went out there. Uh, it probably fill, it was probably really puffy, and then it was sitting out in the sun, and at some point it just exploded and sank away into the depths, <laughs> which again is not particularly surprising for an animal covered in lots of armor. These guys don't uh, appear to be particularly social. This is actually another member. We haven't talked about this group. I've been talking primarily about the ankylosaurs. This is a notosaur. Uh, member, we're going to talk about the difference between those two, but one of the ways, the cheap ways to tell is that it doesn't have a big long club at the end, but they, are, they really are quite interesting animals, right? Very, very neat, massive spines that come off of the neck and whatnot. Anyway, uh, these guys are primarily not found in groups. There is, I think, at least one bone bed with some, uh, with, 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 with a number of individuals together, so maybe occasionally they do come together. That suggests that they're probably solitary, which again is probably not particularly surprising. And they probably, as a result of that, would seek out mates or males would go and look for mates or males would call for females uh, uh, once a year or something and, and then uh, breed with them. Because of the weight and the, we haven't talked yet about the speed of these animals, but they are going to be very slow. Because of the weight and speed at which these guys travel, you can probably expect they're not going to be migratory. These are by and large going to be in the area uh, where they are uh, 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 born and, and raised, right? So that's probably what's going to happen for these guys. Now, I don't have this in the lecture, but probably an issue for animals like this is if you have lots of armor and you weigh a lot, you probably also can't brood on top of eggs. So these animals are also probably not brooding on the eggs. Now, they may do something like crocodiles, where they would bring vegetation and bury eggs within it, but they're probably not brooding on top of eggs like you see with birds. So let's go back and talk about those two groups. I introduced this Notosauridae, which uh, are, are different from the Ankylosauridae. Ankylosauridae are characteristically, characteristically like Ankylosaurus, so they are very, very similar. Notosauridae are probably another group that you may not know as much about, uh, but actually are also very cool. They, the differences between these groups are very, very obvious, um, and the different. So we'll go through the Notosaurus first, and then the Ankylosaurus. Notosaurus, this is. Again, this is generally true. Generally have long pointed snouts, so their head tends to be much larger at the rear than at the front. So they look like uh, little pig snouts as they come out. Uh, we'll look at that. They have very, very muscular shoulders, um, and they have the addition of these acrimoni acrom acromial processes, which are, uh, it's, a, it's a piece of bone that comes out of the shoulder. It's not those big spikes that come out of the neck. But they also often have uh, big spikes up and around the neck, and sometimes they're even curved slightly forward. So you can imagine uh, this animal would point its head at a predator, and that would immediately be very threatening, right? That would be very difficult. Besides the fact that if you're a predator and you try to bite the neck, very difficult to get access to um, um, something like a jugular vein or something, because they're going to be sheathed in these huge layers of bone. They're also going to have generally wider hips, uh, and they're going to have usually um, a simple end with uh, just a tail like you would see in, in uh, most reptiles, just leading to a simple tail. They're not going to have that characteristic club. They're not going to have that club. And chylosaurs, on the other hand, are going to, no, notosaurs are going to take some offensive weaponry here. They're going to they're gonna make defensive weaponry, but they're going to add these big sharp spines right to the body. And chylosaurs are going to go in completely into defensive stuff with the tail finally being uh, the offensive weapon. They're going to be 
extremely heavily armored. They're going to have armor on some of them coming all the way down the arm. They're going to have armor that goes along the body. They're going to have armor that comes around the neck. They'll have armor on the head. They'll have armor covering their eyes. These will be very heavy animals. Um, they will have spines on the body, but they'll tend to be fairly short and broad as opposed to long and spiky. So if you think about a, an ankylosaur, they may have bumpy spines on the back, which would be uncomfortable to necessarily sit on, but they wouldn't, they wouldn't be dangerous in that they wouldn't punch through skin, per se. They would just, be, they would just look really cool. Uh, they will always, as far as we have right now, they will always have these big massive clubs at the end, and uh, if you, even if you don't have the end of a, an ankylosaur's tail, you will see that to bear that much weight because the clubs will be hugely heavy, the bones in the tail will be ossified together to actually hold that tail um, without having it snap off when it lifts up that much weight. So their tails will look like somebody went crazy uh, with a model set and glued bones all over it. And that's, again, to provide that structure for that. Head here on the ankylosaurs is generally going to be short and broad, so they will not have a snout per se. It's just going to be, it's going to be roughly the same size all the way along. And the squamosal uh, bones on the head will actually grow out of the skull and end up like two little ears. Well, they're not ears in a sense, but they'll look like two points that will come out like cartoon ears on the back of the skull. Certainly are not functioning as ears, but they, they do look quite cool. This is a notosaur, right? And I'm going to point these things as we go through. Here is the wider hip as opposed to the shoulder, right? So they have a big wide hip. Why would they need a big wide hip region? It's not for giving birth. They're not concerned about that. Uh, it might be upper body. What else? Herbivory. What about it? Uh huh. And what would you need to digest more material? Hind gut. Right. You might need. You might actually need uh, more gut. You might actually have evolved at this point different gut. So you may have to evolve. Um, different processing locations, right? It may not be particularly different from the way that ruminants have different guts that do different things. This may be what this is facilitating is access to another location to basically put uh, bacteria. And the, the shape of the head, which I haven't quite shown you yet with these red lines, but I will in just a second, also suggests some specificity, right? This narrow pointed snout tends to suggest that their head is aimed at something, so they're picking that out, as opposed to having a big, broad, uh, muscular um, uh, uh, mouth that would just it, it sort of grab whatever is available to them. So these animals may be selecting some type of plant material. It may be fairly hard to break down and they may need uh, a secondary gut or additional gut space uh, to process that food. That Again, it doesn't prove that that's the case. It suggests that something is going on in that way. And we're using lots of different pieces to try to get at that. Here's this, uh, you, can, you can see it right here, that process that comes off of the shoulder. And then also right here, you see it like a sort of a dog ear coming off of that bone. Now, those are, they will stick out to the side. Unfortunately, with a 2D image, it's hard to see. If you had this animal in front of you as a skeleton, you would, you would snap your fingers and say, why is that shoulder? Why is there some weird bone coming out of it? It looks like a bone spur coming out. So that will give access to more muscle attachment, right? It'll provide at least some more muscle attachment over there. The head here, and you can see this very, very clearly in this picture, look how tiny the end of the head is relative to the back of the head, right? It's much, much narrower up front. And then, uh, of course, the, 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 the giveaway for this guy here without the club on the tail. So if I just showed you the tail, you would say, oh, that's a notosaur, because it doesn't have that big club at the end. And they're often, uh, they're often here, and I've drawn them on, uh, there's often big spines that come out of the neck region, or at least large uh, bony structures that come out of the neck region, sometimes pointed slightly backwards, sometimes out to the side, sometimes they tend to point forwards. But there's lots of different variety there. Okay, so if you compare this to an ankylosaur, let's look at, I mean, let's just look at this body, right? If you just look at it from the, the top, there's no piece of the surface of the body, so if you're a predator aiming down, there's no piece of the body here that's not covered in armor immediately. And this is going to be very difficult to get access to. The sides of the body are going to be similar. Let's look at the... Uh, let's look at the width here. You can see these guys also, st their hips are of course still wider um, than the shoulder, but they're not nearly so. These are much more similar in size. The head now is very similar front to back, the back of the head being very similar in size to the front of it. So these are, these are going to have very similar sizes. Here are those cool ear things, right? 
They look like little rocket fins coming off the rocket ship here. Uh, those are the squamosal bones coming out, and that, those would actually stick right out of the skull, so you would see those quite clearly on the, on the live animal. And then, uh, obviously, there's this big giant tail club, which of course looks very nice for crushing other bones, right, which is probably predators. For feeding for these guys, these are going to obviously be, we're dealing with a quadruped that is probably no higher than my waist, so at most a meter, right, not much. These are going to be very, very low browsers, and they're probably spending all of their time uh, hanging around picking off low browsing uh, uh, plant material down there. Narrow snouts on notosaurids tend to suggest that they're selecting for something. What that might be is unclear. Uh, we'll need, you need a lot of specimens to do things like gut content work on them, uh, but th they're probably selecting for something. And it may even be that they're doing stuff like digging in the sediments and pulling out uh, tuberous roots and that kind of thing. Broad snouts on ankylosaurus suggest that they're eating whatever they run into. This group is also not dissimilar from the stegosaurs we saw last time in that they appear to have some really nice adaptations to chewing, and yet they look really bad at it uh, in other ways. So they do, unlike stegosaurs, they do appear to have some wear on teeth uh, in, the, in the mouth, so they do appear to, be, to masticate at least a little bit, so there is a little bit of that. But there is very limited differentiation uh, within those teeth. They're very, very similar. And the teeth remain small in size and take up very little room in the mouth. So there's not many, they're not big, and they're not different. And so they, they aren't doing a lot of it. So they may masticate a bit, but they're still not good at it. They're probably better masticators to a degree than the stegosaurs, uh, but they're not going to be nearly as good as some of the other groups. In addition to this, I, uh, they have uh, large hyoid bones, which support things like tongues. And so if they have really large hyoid bones, they also probably had very large tongues. Again, tongues are indicative of animals that chew because the tongue manipulates food within the mouth and also holds the material up close to the teeth so that you can get access to it. They do have extensive secondary palates. So remember, that's that plate of bone at the top of your mouth that separates your nasal passages from your uh, digestive tract, at least briefly, uh, and that allows you to chew because you, you can breathe and chew, right? So you can spend time breathing instead of worrying so much about uh, taking a bite, holding your breath, swallowing it, and then taking another bite. So they do have secondary palates. which suggests they spend time with food in their mouth. They have well de really well-developed cheeks. You'll see this when I zoom in on the head. But their, their teeth are so obviously indented in the head, it looks like somebody took the, the teeth and squished them in. They are so far inside the head, you could almost stick your entire fist in next to their head um, and have room for it uh, within their cheeks. So they, have a, they have a lot of cheek space. And you'll also see this. They have actually really uh, um, uh, obvious coronoid processes for attachments of muscle to the back of the skull. Uh, so they have the ability to chew in that way. So most of these things here suggest actually fairly good uh, chewing, but the uh, teeth uh, really are not um, strongly in agreement with that. They aren't, they don't strongly agree that there's a lot of use of chewing within the body. Okay, so this is, so let's look at the head, right? Look at the indentation here for this cheek, right? Look how far in that is. And the same over here, right? Look how far in uh, those tooth rows are set. But then also look at the teeth. Look how few there are. There aren't that many teeth. There's just one layer of them. They're small. Uh, there's no differentiation. You do, however, see that very characteristic thing of herbivores where we now have a cropping portion up front, an empty space in between, and then a chewing battery back here, right? So they are looking like uh, most chewing herbivores that we know about. Here's that coronoid process on the back of the jaw that's going to allow muscle attachments up to the back of the head, which will be useful for chewers because they'll need a large muscle that won't tire, so they can go back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. Uh, and uh, you'll also notice uh, here that the difference, again, in the, in the size of these, um, these animals' uh, heads and the, the openings at the, the mouth region, right? Here's a nice big, broad opening. Here's a much narrower opening that's probably selecting for some material within the environment. I did mention this already in the sense that why their guts might be, or why their hips might be so large, they do apparently have extremely large guts. And that is not, again, surprising. Animals are probably not spending a lot of time chewing relative to later ornithischians. And so they probably, or I should say more derived ornithischians because these guys actually appear also late 
in the history, uh, but they probably spend a lot of their uh, uh, gut space on processing and breaking down plant material for access to those resources. There may be highly differentiated uh, guts, like we said, uh, for symbiotic bacteria. Again, vertebrates are not really capable of breaking down cellulose. They depend on bacteria to do that. Uh, but they might have, in the case of notosaurs, they might have needed that if they're eating some specialized diet. It might be more poisonous. It might be more fibrous. It might be woody. Uh, it might be um, a type of plant that has a very waxy cuticle. Um, it might be seeds of some sort, right? And so all of those things you could think of would make it harder for an herbivore to break things down, and so it would need more gut space uh, to do that. Probably the things that they're relying on are things that are not uncommon today. Uh, ferns are certainly going to be on the table for these guys. Small gymnosperms, so small trees are definitely going to get eaten up, but even small, small gymnosperms uh, that don't get up to the size of uh, uh, tens of feet are also going to be consumed. Cycads, which again, cycads are relatively rare today. They kind of look like miniature palm trees. They're not miniature palm trees. Uh, they're a different group, but I, I would say they look something like that. They usually have big barreled uh, uh, sort of stems, which, which leaves grow out of. If you, if you go to Home Depot, you can buy some. And this is, this is true at the very end of the Cretaceous. They will probably dine on some angiosperms because angiosperms will be small at that point and not huge, uh, but for, of course, any time in the early Cretaceous or Jurassic, angiosperms are not going to be available, so you won't have those. Angiosperms, of course, belong to what group, what are the, what are those plants called? Flowering. flowering, your flowering plants, yeah. So, yeah, so at ESF, when I say stuff like this, people are like, oh yeah, flowering plants. If you go to other places, then you don't have this as much because uh, people aren't as interested in trees. But angiosperms are certainly uh, uh, going to be on the menu uh, once we get into the later Cretaceous. Brains for these guys, not terribly different than the stegosaurs. Also very, very low. They're going to fall out right about here. Uh, so they're going to fall uh, just slightly higher than the sauropods, which is not saying much. And that would make them uh, considerably less uh, brain per body mass than things like crocodiles. So you, they're not going to be hugely intelligent. Here's stegosaurs, stegosaurs, and ankylosaurs, right? So they're going to fall out right in there. The, within that, again, uh, if the brain is actually doing work of, of scent, right, so if it's actually being predominantly used for, for scent allocation, uh, then the, they're going to be relatively limited on things like social interactions because they won't have the brain power for it, uh, but they will be able to do, wait, they might be able to smell things relatively well. We're going to look at this thing again. Uh, the, there are, the other groups in here uh, are also important to take a look at, so I, I promise you you'll see uh, the, the list of stupid up again. These guys, yeah, these guys are definitely not that intelligent. These, what group do these guys belong to? Are they? Okay, so they're on chylosaurs. Look at the squamosal bones here. Really dead giveaways for that. And of course, if you if you look at the tail, look also here um, at the thickness of the armor um, that comes all the way down. They're they're formed now in plates around the body. Uh, and then of course we don't see a lot of uh, spines around the neck. And you can't see inside, so you can't see that process off of the shoulder, but, but um, it, would also, it should also not be there. In this case, you also will not be able to see the width of the head, so the width of the head will not be a characteristic you could use in a picture like this to determine it. Okay, so these guys are probably just based on... Oh, yeah, go ahead. What's uh, the question? Do all notosaurs have the big spikes coming out of their neck? <laughs> no, I won't say all because the group is diverse enough, um, but the ones that I know of, the characteristic ones, yes. They don't have to be enormous but often they do have some uh, material. It can be just bony bumps, but usually it's, it's, some, it's some pretty noticeable stuff. But I will, I, I will say that because this group is probably more, it, it's certainly more diverse than we know, obviously, because we don't get every species that's ever existed. That rule probably doesn't hold everywhere. Uh, these guys are gonna be relatively slow, probably about three kilometers an hour. How fast do you walk? How fast does a human walk? Four or five, yeah, it's actually a very good guess. Four or five is about the speed at which you walk. Um, so you would actually have to slow down your walk to stay up to them, and that's probably when they want to walk. They probably aren't walking all that often. Almost certainly they're not getting above 10 kilometers an hour. It, it's probably very difficult to impossible for them to actually pace themselves higher than that. 
So, uh, and, and that, again, it's not surprising. Animals that have spent so much energy on armor are not also going to invest in the characters that are going to help them be better runners. They're not attempting to run away from their predator. Their goal is to make themselves either so hard to consume that the predator will not attempt it, or when, they are, when the predator does arrive and attempt to eat them, they are so hard to consume that they, they give up at some point, right? They can either uh, force them away uh, or the predator will just, will just give up before they even have a chance to get access to the, the uh, soft parts of the body. This is actually uh, also from the American Museum of Natural History. And what I want you to look at here, uh, this is a, an ankylosaur tail. This is very, very large, noticeably large. This is like bigger than my abdomen large. These are huge things. Uh, there are all sorts of things that are, are uh, used to deal with predators. But look closely here at these folded uh, layers right on top, right? These are ossified uh, tendons and bones now. Um, and that is fused all the way down uh, into the tail. So very clearly, as you would expect, a giant thing of bone is very heavy. Uh, and as a result, if you want to support that with a tail, you're going to need really, 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 really heavily ossified tails. So that means their tails are not going to be flexible in general. They may be flexible up nearer to the hip so it can swing it back to and forth, but at the end it's not going to be flexible, which means that uh, it's not going to be useful for things uh, like balance or counterbalancing uh, when you're doing jumping, right? So these animals are not doing a lot of jumping because you don't have the flexibility within that tail, which again is not particularly surprising. But if you're attempting to hit something with this big club, having a really nice strong tail makes sure that you can get that thing back. So that's a fair question. So are the tails dragged or are they held up in the air? And if you look at old reconstructions, absolutely they will be dragged on the ground. But we do have footprints and there is no drag mark behind it. So these guys are not predominantly dragging their tails and that is not unsurprising for dinosaurs because they don't appear, even the very large ones don't appear. So we don't have any groups that apparently drag regularly. Um, so the, the, tail, the tails have apparently been pulled up. Probably there's a sheet of tendon that runs all the way up to the shoulders that anchors it there, and so you don't even need muscles. It just holds it up off the ground away from that, which is a, a lot of animals rely on that is, is uh, tendon to reduce weight and help to, to anchor things so you don't have to pay for muscle strength to, to work on it. So that's probably a great anti-predatory device. Uh, the other cool thing about this, right, so let's look at the bones here. Look at all of this. Yeah, just the knob and the handle apparently is what these are called, which is fine, I guess. But these are all um, ossified. Look at all these. And then the vertebrae are present underneath them, right? They're, they're almost like they built bone around them. You can see the only place where flexibility is allowed is where you would expect it, uh, down very close to the hips and at the, at the very edge of the tail as it exits uh, the primary portion of the body. And that gives you flexibility side to side and probably a little tiny bit up to down, but not much because if it goes up, down, it'll snap off these processes on top. So really the tail um, is going to have only flexibility at one point, so it won't be particularly dissimilar from if you held a big bag in your arm and you pivoted it at your elbow, right? If you pushed it up against your body and then pivoted it at the elbow, this is the sort of thing that, it, that you can expect that tail to be able to do. Also, if you look at this ilium, look how large that is. So that is because there's a sheet of muscle which covers that and then reaches back into the tail to provide that side-to-side -side motion. So you're going to have one giant muscle right here, and down here they've cut it off so they can, they can show you other stuff. So they'll have one giant muscle sheet right here that it will connect across, and then of course you'll have another giant muscle sheet just below that, right, connecting to the other side. So there's a lot of power in this tail. So what I'm saying is don't get in front of this tail when it's moving back and forth because it can do a lot of damage. The other thing about this is uh, the, the tail also, is, this is not just solid bone. What the tail is actually constructed of is there's a thick layer of uh, very dense bone on the outside, and then with inside of that, there's a very spongy layer of bone uh, inside of it. Why is that the case? Why isn't it just solid bone throughout? To absorb impacts, exactly. Because if you had solid bone and you hit something, it would tend to want to fracture. So all that pressure would come across. You'll see, you'll look at solid bone Next week, we're going to look at the pachys, uh, which, are, which have these really nice big heads, right, which are a lot of solid bone. Uh, and those, uh, those do look like they can take solid impact. Uh, but if you have a, a truly solid thing and you smack it against something, it will tend to want to shatter, right? It doesn't have a way to reduce those forces. So those force lines extend over and over. And if you hit it a couple times, you'll tend to get fracture lines. 
Well, you don't want to do that if you're growing in an animal. You really want that thing to be used again. So that spongy center, what happens is when that hard surface hits, it directs the forces inwards. The spongy center tends to absorb them, and it reduces those pressures on the, the bone, and so you can keep using it over and over again. That doesn't, and I want to make this clear too, it doesn't guarantee that the tail is used for defense. It only suggests that there's a lot of evidence pointing to that the tail is good at hitting things and good at moving very quickly. Could it also have something to do with decreasing weight? What, the spongy bone? Yeah. Certainly there's probably, uh, there's probably an advantage to reducing the weight, but because the animal is so heavy elsewhere, it's probably not going to save much weight in the tail relative to where else it can reduce. So it's probably not, it, it, can't, it wouldn't be that alone that would explain it. So the, 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 the club itself, um, and there are different papers that have come out and looked at the speed at which the club can move and whether it can hit. Absolutely, if you were a T-Rex and you got hit by an ankylosaur club, you would have a broken leg and that would effectively be lethal. You would die. Uh, you would not be able to survive long enough, most likely, and you would certainly be very vulnerable to another T-Rex and you would be incapacitated almost immediately. And we actually do have footprints with predatory dinosaurs with limps, so they probably have broken legs or broken components. Whether that's from an ankylosaur or not is not, we don't know, and it, but it does suggest that dinosaurs regularly do have broken bones and have to live with them. Um, did the actual, um, uh, what do we call it, the club ever break? Is it, was that, is that possible? So if your club broke, uh, and your, it was, it would depend on how bad it was, uh, but it, it, because bone will be living material, it would it could repair itself uh, to that degree. That will probably be less of a problem if you hit something so hard that it breaks, though, uh, or you're get you're having to use it that frequently. You probably have other issues going on as well. But if the, if it did break, if there was an issue where it broke for whatever reason, the bone would naturally be able to repair itself given enough time. And that will also be true of uh, fractures that we see with other things. Other questions about this guy? So I think, I, I would say, of the cool anti-predatory defenses, these are definitely some of the coolest. When we get to the other group, uh, there will be some very cool, obvious external characters which may be used for anti-predator devices like tr uh, Triceratops, right? They have these really cool horns and frill, but actually used against predators? Uh, prob actually, probably not, we think. Uh, that's probably for social interactions more. Okay, so we're going to go and deal with uh, next, next, I guess, next lecture, which is next week. We're going to deal with this group called the Marginocephali, or Marginocephalia. Uh, those, of course, are uh, the, the groups that deal with modifications of the head. And the two groups within that are, of course, the Pachys, and then what's the other group? What is, what is another common member of this group? I just mentioned one of them. These are the, the Ceratopsians, which are your traditional Triceratops, your Taurosaurus, your uh, Styracosaurus. You'll learn things like Pachyrhinosaurus. There's a lot of different groups. Uh, but in any case, they will have, instead of having modifications, we've seen now in two groups that belong together, right? They've, they've, both, come to the, they've both come to this sort of same endpoint, which is modify the tail and apparently make it a weapon. Uh, and they've also had modify the body and add armor to it, at least to some degree. These guys are also going to be related. The Ceratopsians and the uh, Pachys are going to be similar. Instead of the, that, they're going to go with modifications of the head. And they are, modifications of the head are apparently going to be primarily for social interactions. This picture is going to give us a... Ri we're, going to, we're going to really have to talk about whether their heads are actually used for head-on budding. There's lots of issues with that. Uh, and that's why we'll save that uh, for the next lectures. So we are...